Intro to the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians, so chapter 21. Rock bands and other popular music artists often perform cover versions of songs with which their audience is already familiar. The trick is not to copy the song exactly, but rather to reinvent it in creative and interesting ways without losing those features that made the piece appealing in the first place. Indeed, some artists have been known to do cover versions of their own songs, revising past hits sufficiently to gain them a new hearing for a new day. The New Testament letter, known as 2 Thessalonians, might be thought of as a cover version of the letter known as 1 Thessalonians. The content and format are remarkably similar, but the tone has changed. The first letter mentioned destruction that will come upon unbelievers on the Day of Judgment. The second seems to relish such condemnation. The first letter said that idlers should be admonished. The second says that they should be denied food. The first letter said that everyone in the community was to hear what the letter said. The second says that they are to obey what it says or else be shunned by other church members. Much, but not all, of what is found in 2 Thessalonians comes across as a harsher version of what was said more gently in the letter we examine in the preceding chapter. A key question becomes whether the author is Paul restating his own material in a more strident vein, or is someone else reshaping one of the apostles' greatest hits in more stern and forbidding style. A brief salutation overview. A brief salutation identifies Second Thessalonians as being from Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy, who testified to how the Thessalonians' mutual love and faithfulness in persecution have inspired pride and thanksgiving among the churches of God. This is followed by a promise that God will wreak vengeance on those who afflict the Thessalonians, punishing them with eternal destruction on the day of judgment. The mention of that day leads to instruction on a significant issue. Some people have been telling the Thessalonians that the day of the Lord has already arrived. The authors assure them that this is not the case, and that, indeed, that day will not come until after the lawless one mounts a final and futile opposition to God. The authors are confident that the Thessalonians will not be among those deceived by the satanic foe, provided they hold fast to what Paul taught them. They offer the Thessalonians their blessing in this regard, ask for their prayers in return, repeat the affirmation of confidence, and offer another blessing, similar to the first. Then the letter turns to another topic, addresses the problem of idleness. The Thessalonians ought to follow the example of productive labor that Paul set for them, and they should avoid association with believers who do not follow this example. The letter closes with two benedictions and some words in Paul's own handwriting, by which the readers will be able to recognize the authenticity of this letter as coming from him rather than from someone using his name to mislead them. Historical Background Our knowledge regarding the historical background of this letter is uncertain. Let's start with a brief review of what we do know. Thessalonica was the capital city for the Roman province of Macedonia, located in what is now northern Greece. Paul founded a church composed mainly of Gentiles in the city sometime around 48 to 51. He was forced to leave the city amid growing persecution, and he later wrote the letter that we now know as 1 Thessalonians to the struggling church that he had left behind. What happened next? One possible scenario is pretty straightforward. A few months after writing 1 Thessalonians, Paul received word back from the church that a new crisis had erupted. The Thessalonians were so eager and excited about the imminent return of Christ that some of them had bought in on a rumor that the day of the Lord is already here. We are not certain exactly what they thought this meant, or where they would have gotten this notion. An enthusiastic prophecy by one of their members, or a forged letter from someone claiming to be Paul, or a misinterpretation of the teaching of 1 Thessalonians. In any case, Paul realized that it was time to write them another letter to sort things out. According to this scenario, the letter, known as 2 Thessalonians, was written from Corinth by Paul and his companions a few months after 1 Thessalonians, sometime between 50 and 53. The main point of the letter comes in chapter 2, where Paul teaches the Thessalonians about what must happen before the day the Lord arrives. For many students of the Bible, the scenario outlined above provides a reasonable historical context for understanding this letter. It certainly is the context within which the church has been understood throughout most of church history. In modern times, however, an alternative scenario has been suggested and has gathered significant support. According to this view, the letter was not actually written by Paul, and it may not have been written to the Thessalonians. 
It comes from a later time, years after Paul's death, when Christians regarded the apostles' warnings as authoritative treatises, almost on a par with Scripture. By that time, as Christians had continued to think about the second coming of Christ, they had come up with ideas that would never have occurred to Paul, ideas developed in some response to things that had happened in the Roman Empire. Some of these ideas are presented in the book of Revelation and in the Synoptic Gospels, the books that were written two or four decades after Paul wrote 1 Thessalonians. So according to this suggestion, some Christian who is unknown to us wrote a new letter from Paul expressing these ideas about the second coming. The person who did this apparently had a copy of 1 Thessalonians and used it as a model for creating a composition that would read something like Paul would have written. Although the letter is ostensibly addressed to the Church of Thessalonians, it probably was intended for circulation among Christians throughout the Roman Empire. If this is the case, then we don't know who wrote the letter, or where, or when, though proponents of this view think that some date in the 80s seems likely. Still, the main point of the letter is once again assumed to be the teaching about the end times presented in chapter 2. In sum, questions regarding the best context for understanding 2 Thessalonians revolve around the issue of whether this is actually a letter from Paul. If 2 Thessalonians is by Paul, then it should be read as one of his earliest compositions. Indeed, it is likely to be the second earliest Christian writing that we possess and it may be read as a virtual postscript to 1 Thessalonians, dealing with a particular crisis that arose in one early Christian congregation. If 2 Thessalonians is not by Paul, then it should be understood as presenting generic instruction on what had become a matter of interest decades later. Major Themes in 2 Thessalonians The Certainty of Judgment The author of 2 Thessalonians assures the Christian's believers that those who are persecuting them will have to answer to God for their misdeeds. When the Lord Jesus comes, accompanied by angels, he will bring flaming fire and will wreak a terrible vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel. Thus, all opponents of Christianity, Gentile and Jew alike, will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, separated from God's presence forever. A number of scholars have noted that Paul does write elsewhere about judgment and the wrath of God. But usually, he does not relish the eventual suffering of his enemies, as he is sometimes thought to do here. Nevertheless, the accent in this section of the letter perhaps is not on the negative aspects of judgment, but rather is on the relief of the afflicted and on the vindication of Jesus, whose name will be glorified at last. The Coming of the Lawless One The most significant new content in 2 Thessalonians concerns the teaching that the day of the Lord, the second coming of Jesus Christ, will not occur until after the rebellion comes and the lawless one is revealed. This lawless one may already be present. The mystery of lawlessness concerning him is already at work. For the moment, however, he is being restrained by someone or something. After this restraint is removed, The lawless one will be revealed. He will take his seat in the temple of God and declare himself to be God. And then the Lord Jesus will blow him away, literally. We do not know for certain what this means. Scholars who think that Paul wrote 2 Thessalonians usually assume that he has filled the Thessalonians in on details that are unavailable to us. Interpreters often have assumed that some of the references in this section of the letter are to recent or current events in the Roman Empire. But there are many guesses as to which events those might be. Various offenses to Christianity associated with Caligula, Nero, and Domination would qualify, especially if the letter is regarded as pseudepigraphic and thus as difficult to date. In any case, if the imagery is based on the author's visions of the future, then identifications with figures from his own time might be beside the point. The text might be intended simply to offer Christians a somewhat hazy and ambiguous forecast of things to come, with confidence that those who love the truth will be able to figure it out when it happens. It is possible, though by no means certain, that some of the imagery is symbolic. The temple could be a metaphor for God's presence or dwelling place. In any case, the main point of the passage seems to be to establish a chronology of events that disprove the notion that the day of the Lord is already here. The restraining agency has not yet been removed, therefore the lawless one has not been revealed, 
Therefore, the day of the Lord has not arrived. There are a few points of contact between what is presented here and in other New Testament writings. The lawless one described in this passage may be analogous to the Antichrist referred to in the Johannian letters, and to the beast mentioned in Revelation, though all these figures seem to be distinctive in some aspects. The idea that people in the last days will be deceived by satanic signs and wonders resonates with some ideas presented in the Synoptic Gospels, as is the claim that the end-time scenario will involve a great act of apost apostasy in the temple. The unique element in 2 Thessalonians is the reference to someone or something that restrains the lawless one until the appointed time, a point that apparently is not made elsewhere. The problem of idleness. The author of 2 Thessalonians addresses a problem of idleness that was mentioned in the first letter addressed to this church. This time a command is given. Anyone unwilling to work should not eat. It was common in those days for Christians to share a common meal together. Individuals may have viewed the provision of free food as a way to survive off the large, the largesse of the community. It is also possible that some people try to offer spiritual rationalizations for not being gainfully employed. They were devoting, them, devoting themselves to prayer or to waiting on the Lord. Yet another possibility is that this rebuke of idleness is addressed to rich persons who had no need to work for a living and so spent their lives as mere busybodies, not doing any work. Whatever the situation, the point obviously is not that persons who are unable to work or unable to find work should be deprived of food. Rather, those who are unwilling to work are to be excluded from the community meal. Paul, Timothy, and Silas set an example for all by holding down full-time jobs as manual labors while evangelizing the city and founding the church. Conclusion Although 2 Thessalonians perhaps lacks the warmth and affection of the first letter addressed to the church at Thessalonica, it does convey a fundamentally positive message. The harsh tone must be understood against the backdrop of the letter's two most prominent concerns the virulent persecution of Christians on account of their faith, and an alarming misinterpretation of doctrine that threatens to undermine that faith. The letter tries to put a positive spin on the afflictions that the believers have had to endure. Not only will the Thessalonian believers be vindicated by God's justice in the final day, but already, in the present, their suffering is having positive effects. Their endurance in these trials has made them steadfast, so that their faith is growing abundantly and their love for one another is increasing. The first letter, written to the Thessalonians, maintained that God's faithful people are destined to suffer. Now the second letter to them reveals why. Persecutions and afflictions are intended to make believers worthy of the kingdom of God. The eschatological teaching of the second Thessalonians also conveys a fundamentally positive message. Christians are encouraged to view themselves as living in what might be regarded as an initial phase of the end times. The events of the last days seem to be underway but they have only just begun. The coming of Christ is soon, but not immediate. The time that remains is not to be wasted on fan fanatical speculation and idle anticipation. The Thessalonians should look forward to their almost imminent deliverance, but they should view the waiting period as a time to be used productively for Christian growth and mission, as a time for doing what is right.